Our next speaker is Dr. Rene Zenteno. Dr. Rene Zenteno is a professor of demography here in the College of Public Policy at the University of Texas at San Antonio. Under the, under, as the Undersecretary of Population, Migration, and Religious Affairs at the Ministry of the Interior in Mexico, where he served from 2010 to 2012, Centeno was instrumental in writing, negotiating, and enacting the 2011 Mexican Immigration Law. He's been the Provost and Professor at El, at El Colegio de la Frontera Norte, Norte and an Executive Director of the Center for U.S.-Mexican Studies at the University of, of California, San Diego. He's published widely in the areas of social and demographic change, international migration and social inequality with a focus on Mexico, U.S.-Mexican migration, and a Mexican migrant incorporation. Thank you very much uh, to the Mexico Center and the College of Public Policy for the invitation. I, for those of us who have been working on migration, it's uh, no, this one here. For many, many years, and also in my case, living in the U.S.-Mexico border, you think that you have seen everything. You know, we saw IRCA and the implementation of IRCA in the late 1980s. We saw the Mexican crisis of the 1990s. We saw the U.S. economy booming and migration flows from Mexico like never seen before. We saw IRA IRA as a very important cornerstone, legal cornerstone for what we're seeing now in terms of border security in the United States. We saw 9-11. We saw the changes in the law and the creation of the Homeland Security in the United States. We saw the economic recession of the U.S. and a significant decline of migration flows in the last five years from Mexico to the U.S., or at least trying to cross with that document uh, to the United States. Well, we, we haven't seen everything, and we still get surprised about how creative, especially when we're talking about policy, we can be creating unexpected consequences on migration because for many years, we haven't been able to really fix a broken immigration system in North America. And if we don't fix that system, we are going to keep facing again and again and again these kind of issues. I know there is a lot of complexity, especially today in the United States, about what is happening. But I believe, and that's one of the messages I would like to convey today, that Mexico can play a more important role, a leadership role today, because it's in much better position than never before to play the leadership with or between the United States and, and uh, Central American countries. I will get back to you. So before, because I usually take a lot more than the time <laughs> I'm allowed to talk, I would like to convey four ideas mainly. One, what we have seen today, migration from Central America to the U.S., especially on a company minors, it's a highly sophisticated process. It's not random, it's highly organized with the participation of families in the United States, families in Central America, but also the participation of smugglers, coyotes, costly process, yeah? Organized crime is more and more involved in this business and also it's easy, believe me, to cross to the US if you have enough resources to do it. It's highly organized and also Many authorities, corrupted authorities in Guatemala, in El Salvador, and in Mexico play, play a very important role on moving these migrants, especially through the most difficult part, which is crossing to Mexico in order to come to the border. And also, as we will see, all of these children and families with, with minors are crossing pretty much only in one place, yeah, which is the Rio Grande area. How can they cross? In, to the most dangerous part of Mexico tells you a lot about who is organizing this amazing business. I'm sorry, I, I, I don't want to sound like that, but it's very good business for organized crime today to move children and women to cross from Central America to the United States. Second, and I think uh, Nestor uh, team, uh, made a very good presentation, it's very difficult to say one single reason why this is happening. I think violence, of course, is playing a very important role, but that's not new. Violence has been there, has been increasing over time, but you see the rates, and you will see it again here. We have been having these high rates of homicides and crime in Central America for a long time. And for Mexico, it's more recent, and as we would see, the number of minors has increased a little bit, but not as fast as the number of minors from Central America. 
Of course, we're talking about a lot of poverty, structural poverty in many, many years, a lot of inequality in these countries. We are talking about the lack of institutions, the lack of justice in many of these countries. You cannot really go and present a case if something happened to you or try to protect for your life if you go to the authorities. And also, very important lately, has been the misunderstanding of many legal processes in the United States that have been passing to Central America in a very twisted way, but to the advantage of smugglers and to the advantage of organized crime, that they really found a great business on moving children and women, because they usually charge 30 or 40% more than moving another male adult migrant from Central America to, uh, to the United States. And again, Mexico can play an important role, and I would like to argue why. One, because Mexico at least now has corrected a very important contradiction it has in terms of law, that when Mexico used to stand to discuss with the United States, hey, you need to protect the rights of Mexican nationals in the United States, they would always point out that the legal framework in Mexico was worse, not only the US, it was worse than the state of Arizona today. Mexicans were criminalizing more, and, and still today, more abuses of migrants happen in Mexico than happen in the United States. But Mexico changed its law. It's on their new revision of how to really change the view to protect migrants. We don't criminalize more in Mexico uh, migrants like we used to, like used to be in the past. Second, migration flows from Mexico are very low today compared with what we saw in the past. So that's not going to be a point of the discussion where Mexico can stand to talk to the United States. Okay. We will never have this opportunity again, because if the economy of the U.S. recover, migration flows can recover again. I don't think it's going to be at the same level that we saw in the past, but it will be very important to recognize that it may happen again, and we need to fix this system before the economy of the U.S. really recover. So I will talk to you, uh, to you about this very quickly. You can see how especially the, 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 the economic recession in the, U in the U.S. really hit apprehensions along the U.S.-Mexican border, mainly because the Mexicans stopped coming to the U.S. because the opportunities were not there, and also because the security has been tightened and tightened over time to cross the U.S. border. It's more difficult to cross today the border. Yeah, we don't need more walls. We don't, we don't need more border agents. It became very difficult because of many years of investment in border infrastructure in the United States. But you see the decline pretty much stopped in 2011, the significant decline from 20, uh, 2006, and again recovered during the last two years. <coughs> Why did it recover? Because of the Mexican migration? No. Pretty much Mexican migration, if you talk about apprehensions here, not all the, all the migration flows, it's pretty much stagnant. I mean, it has stabilized. It's not experiencing more decline like in the past. It will continue probably at these low levels for many years. I mean, we don't know how many. Again, it depends on many factors like the economy <coughs> in the U.S. But like the Department of Homeland Security uh, classified migrants other than Mexico, yeah, it has been experiencing a significant increase in the last two years. And in the past, no more than 10% of migrants that were apprehended in the southwest border uh, were from other countries than Mexico, but today it's around 36%. <coughs> And in the Rio Grande area, they are the majority of the migrants that are today uh, apprehended by the, by, the, uh, by the U.S. authorities. Here again, yeah, they are crossing many back. This is, uh, we are moving from total apprehensions to minors here that have been detained without the company of any of the parents. As you can see, the rise has been in only one border point, which is the border, the Texas border with Mexico, the Rio Grande area. Why they are crossing there when Tamaulipas is today, along with Michoacán, the most dangerous state in terms of violence? Because two drug cartels, sectors, and the Gulf cartels are fighting every day, every single day, to take control of the state of Tamaulipas. But once you go on interview, which was my case exactly a year ago, that I had the opportunity to go to Guatemala and talk to deported uh, migrants from the United States in the Guatemala City Airport. It's like, whenever they come to Tamaulipas, all of them are delivered to either the Zetas or the drug cartels. And those are the ones that put them in security housing in Reynosa or Matamoros and cross the border when they have the opportunity to do so. Highly successful to cross the border, but today, because of the, the number of border agents, most of them are really caught right away and they are deported. But the children, because of the change, which I'm not going to talk about that change in law, because we have a panel, we will discuss of that, they go through a different process. And that's why 
they even don't care if they are stopped or not, by, or quickly or not, by the U.S. authorities. But the same happened with family unit apprehensions. Most of them, almost all of them, have increased between 2013 and 2014, has been in just one place, <coughs> in the region, in the Texas border. This is Mexico. You can see Mexico also experienced a small increase. But as you can see both from the percentage I, I showed you before, it has not been as fast as Central American migrants. But you have a small increase also in the detention of unaccompanied children uh, uh, in the U.S.-Mexico border. But different from children that come from Central America, they are detained and deported right away in any of the uh, Mexican border crossings with the United States. As you can see here, this is unaccompanied immigrant children applications to how Mexico disappeared pretty much as the dominant country of this uh, type of migration in the United States to be only 22%. You can see the rapid increase of Honduras, I mean, very connected, of course, to the violence in Honduras. And when you see which one is the most vulnerable group of immigrants crossing to Mexico and detained in the United States are people from Honduras. Why? Because some of the arguments of the, the migrants themselves use Guatemalans and Salvadorians, they look more like Mexicans. They can cross the border. They can cross, I'm sorry, the Mexican territory without much of a challenge. Of course, they also suffer abuses. But the Honduras migrants, which have darker skins, are taller, are bigger. They're always wearing, uh, uh, wearing uh, baseball hats. They are very easy to identify, and they are more subject to abuses in Mexico than any migrants from Guatemala or from El Salvador. And here, I'm not going to take that long time. This is what you saw more or less about what is happening in these countries. It's something that we thought that we would never see again. And of course, we are seeing, again, a lot of instability, a lot of violence, and especially a growing presence, the same that make, like it happened to Mexico, of organized crime, taking care, controlling whole territories in Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. So pretty much. All the, south, the, 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 the southern part of Mexico and Central America and countries are pretty much taken by uh, organized crime today. And that, okay, this is the information that uh, uh, Nestor already uh, presented about violence in Central America compared with Mexico. And this is part of the process, yeah? This is Mexico's other border, which is totally different than what you see in Nuevo Laredo, in Reynosa, in Ciudad Juárez, El Paso, San Diego, Tijuana. There is probably like 16 formal crossings between Mexico and the US, and there are 56 informal border crossings between Mexico and the US. Everything can, have, can cross there. People, trucks, cars, smuggling, everything. And both everybody in the government of Mexico and Guatemala, they know that. Yeah, but they don't control those points. 56 informal points. So this is how they cross in just a very important Ciudad Hidalgo. Yeah, in the, this is the Suchiate River. And this is how they cross every day to do grocery shopping, to do shopping. But at the end, migrants also cross, right? So they can cross. There is no uh, checkpoint where they have to present any passport. This is the river. One side is Guatemala, the other side is Mexico. They just came to the other side, just walk into the city of Ciudad Hidalgo. Uh, in the south part of Chiapas. This is how the poorest migrants that can afford, that they, they can afford a coyote, those are the ones that take the famous train, the beast or the bestia, because they don't have resources to really afford eight to ten thousand dollars to come to the United States. But those who can afford it, they don't travel in the train. They travel usually in buses or in trucks like this. This truck was by chance stopped by the Chiapas police because probably there was some misunderstanding about the time that the border crossing was going to have this race, especially operating there, and we were able to cut all these migrants that, as the, the, the priest Solalinde in, in, in Capachula once said, tomatoes travel better than migrants in these trucks, yeah, with air conditioner. No air conditioner, there were migrants from India, China, all over the world, mainly from El Salvador and Guatemala. That's what they were crossing. Some were sitting, some were standing, women, men, children, all kinds of migrants. This is how human trafficking is pretty much organized. There is no problem crossing the border. 
Mexico is trying to now do more work stopping here, yeah, migrants, because it's impossible for Mexico to really try to do something along the Guatemala-Mexico border. What is happening in Mexico has a lot to do with what we're seeing with children too. Why? Because violence has grown in the last six, seven years. It has been very, we have some statistics that show you that the violence is declining in Mexico, but still are very high levels of what we've seen in the last 20, 25 years. And this is usually the, 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 the way migrants come, because it's the shortest way from Guatemala to the U.S. <coughs> is go through Veracruz and go to Tamaulipas. It is a much longer trip to go to Sonora and try to cross the desert, and that's a more, more dangerous part to cross to the United States. This is highly organized. <coughs> All this is controlled in the south by the setas and in the north by the Gulf Cartel and the Setas uh, Cartel. What you see here is how they travel in their beast. Mexico already stopped migrants boarding uh, to, to take this train. Uh, there are major concerns, and I have experienced that when the train is stopped, migrants, they, they won't stop coming. They will take more dangerous routes. And then they are more exposed. They are more vulnerable, and probably they will more likely uh, uh, suffer some uh, uh, abuses during the road. And this is the Tamaulipas uh, killing of 72 migrants uh, that happened in San Fernando in 2010. Uh, that was a, a crisis in Mexico that really prompted to review all the legal uh, framework that we have in Mexico to try to protect that. We know that in countries like Mexico and the same in Central America, and that's, I guess, part of my learning also being a public servant, Laws don't fix everything. It's how you really <laughs> implement those laws, what cares, the regulation, the details about how to get really into the people and the, into the regulations, what happened. This is Mexico. It's a stop in migrants. Mainly adolescents. It's very hard to stop in Mexico kids because you won't see very clearly where the kids from. And you don't bother kids. Most of the minors that Mexico stop are between uh, detained and, uh, uh, and deported to Central American countries are between 15 and 17 years of age. So there are very few minors, really children, that are detained by U.S. authority. But even if the new immigration law in Mexico allows for humanitarian causes to, 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 to stay in Mexico, the immigration authorities don't give that opportunity. And 93% of those who are detained are deported, deported to their, uh, their own country. So it's a very different process than in the U.S. What Mexico is doing is stopping them and pretty much returning all of them without giving them that much of a chance to stay, even if they can argue the same reasons that they are arguing now when they cross to the United States. Uh, Again, about organization and what will happen, and, and this is probably, have, like, probably like, like three minutes now, uh, it's becoming more dangerous to cross the border. If Mexico, and I'm going to probably stop here because I can keep going with these actions about how they are trying to have campaigns now to detain or to stop children coming from Mexico. As you know, the number of children, as some of you will talk about that, has been uh, detained along the US-Mexico border for South America, have been declining in the last uh, few months. But Mexico has two options, and this is what I would like to, to stop. Mexico, who has been always a leader in international forums for the protection of human rights, needs to really stand out and say, look, we cannot keep going like this. Building more walls, putting more agents on the field is not going to stop people coming because the families are separated. That has been discussed here. Because people is looking for better opportunities. And in the case of Central American migrants, because they are really afraid of being back in San Salvador, San Pedro Sula, because they have been really threatened by organized crime. So what Mexico can do is pretty much observe what the law in Mexico says. Finally learn that we cannot be reacting, Mexican government cannot be reacting to everything that happened. It needs to stand more with a clear policy of human rights, to have a conversation with Central American migrants, because Mexico can be more committed to help the development of Central America that the United States now, with many, many international struggles, will be paying attention to Central America now. And finally, Mexico has a long history of giving refugee and asylum to population from Latin America and from Spain. 
We did it with, when the dictatorships in Chile and Argentina, we did it during the Civil War in Spain in the 1930s. We did it with the Guatemalan migrants in the 1980s, and that started to shape Mexican view of human rights too, in, in, in a very kind of uh, early democracy in Mexico. Mexico has to really, has the instruments to really operate a very good policy of friendship and development towards Central America. And I hope that we adopt at some point these kind of policies instead of trying to repeat what the US is doing wrong for many, many years. Thank you very much.